I am but a mirror whose only purpose is to show you what your own eyes cannot yet see. Whenever people list their favorite well-written character in gaming, Kreia tends to be brought up as a shining example. With her Shakespearean mannerism and Machiavellian attitude, she is, without a doubt, one of the most interesting and fleshed out characters in gaming. Her reputation primarily comes from her philosophy that tends to be often misunderstood, both in all world and in the story itself. However, no matter how well written of a character she may be, Kreia does not exist in a vacuum. To be able to fully understand Kreia and her philosophy, some background information about the Jedi and Sith ideologies and their differences is required. In the original Star Wars movie, there was never any defined philosophical distinction between the Jedi and Sith. We only understood that the Jedi were good and that the Sith were evil. There are some thematic hints, such as the Jedi being in tune with nature, while the Empire and the Sith rely on cold technology. The first hint of a philosophical explanation came from Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back. Yes, a Jedi's strength flows from the Force. But beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression. The dark side of the Force are they. Easily they flow, quick to join you in a fight. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. Consume you it will, as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice. Vader. Is the dark side stronger? No. 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 Quicker, busier, more seductive. But how am I to know the good side from the bad? You will know when you are calm, at peace, passive. Mm. A Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense. Never for attack. Later. New material was added in the Star Wars Expanded Universe over the years that fleshed out the Jedi and Sith. But it was only when the game Knights of the Old Republic was released that the Jedi and Sith were each given a coherent ideology. The core of each faction's belief can be understood from their code that outlined the principal tenets of how one should live their life in relation to the Force. Let's start with the Jedi Code. All Jedi must know the code. Its tenets are the fundamental teachings of our order. Think and meditate on these truths, apprentice. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is the Force. By itself, the Jedi Code makes little sense and has brought up a lot of confusion. For example, the very first line, there is no emotion, there is peace, is often misinterpreted as the code saying that there's no such thing as emotions. It is only when you add the word when to each sentence that the Jedi code becomes understandable. When there is no emotion, there is peace. When there is no ignorance, there is knowledge. When there is no passion, there is serenity. When there is no chaos, there is harmony. Essentially, most of the Jedi Code is repeating the same axiom that when there is no conflict or emotions, peace is achieved. The last line of the code could be taken as literal. There is no death, there is the Force. When you die, you become one with the Force. But it could also be understood that when there is no death, there is the Force. Meaning that everything that is living is connected to the Force. Both interpretations are valid. The real-world equivalent of the Jedi Code is Buddhist philosophy, which is appropriate, as the Jedi are essentially space wizard samurai monks. The Force, itself a living energy found in all things that binds the universe together, is similarly shared in Buddhist philosophy, called Prana. It's also commonly known as Chi energy and other different names. By being at peace, you can become in tune with life and the universe. Meditation is a key aspect of Buddhism that is often used by the Jedi to center themselves and remain calm. Buddhism has myriads of teachings and schools of thoughts, but the core shared belief is that all suffering is caused by desires, which creates conflict. Much like the Jedi, Buddhism preaches tranquility, peace, and only using your strength for self-defense. In contrast, the Sith never had much in terms of philosophy in any of the movies. The Emperor was evil for the sake of evil, 
and Vader was nothing more than a broken man in a shell. It is only in the first Knights of the Old Republic game that the Sith were given a proper ideological foundation that went beyond the simple grapples of being evil. On Korriban, the Sith Code is introduced as an alternative to the Jedi Code. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. The first line, that peace is a lie, there is only passion, is a direct refutation of the Jedi axiom that peace can only be found if there are no emotions. And in turn, it becomes the axiom of the Sith. The Jedi would have you believe that peace is a desirable goal. That peace of the spirit is the way the Force is mastered. That a lack of conflict betters man. We know different. It is our passion, our hate, and our desire that fuels the Force. It is conflict that improves the lot of civilization and single being both. Conflict forces one to better oneself. It forces change, growth, adaption, evolution, or death. These are not our laws, but the universe's. Without conflict, you have only stagnation. Just like the Jedi, the Sith equally follow a real-world equivalent, the philosophy of Nietzsche. He similarly valued conflict to better oneself, to use your will to create meaning. The well-known quote, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, very much defines the Sith as an ideology. By affirming your life and imposing your will, you can change the world and mold it as you see fit with your power. This is the ideological groundwork of both philosophies in an idealized manner, and, like all philosophies at the conceptual and abstract level, it is only how we understand and how they are applied that we see their strengths and failings. So now that we have some basic context for the Jedi and Sith, we can dive deeper into what makes Kreia so interesting. Among the canon of Star Wars, Kreia is unique because she experienced the pinnacles of the Jedi and Sith and saw their failings. Kreia's life history gives us an insight to what she learned among those groups. However, her life story isn't told in a linear fashion. We need to piece together the clues that are scattered throughout the game. Since the early days, there is a popular theory that Kreia is the Jedi Master Eren Kai who trained Revan as a Padawan. This is correct, but it's not the complete truth. What is important to understand is that Kreia was known as Eren Kai in the early days of her life. I'll explain why later. Kai was a historian and Jedi Master. She strongly believed in the Jedi Code, but found that it lacked something. She saw that the Jedi Order were failing their students, as many kept falling to the dark side continuously. The allure of power and the call of the dark side is always present, but it doesn't explain why the Jedi would constantly fall despite their training. There was something missing in the Jedi Code itself. Unlike the rest of the Jedi that ignored the teachings of the Sith and viewed it as taboo, Kai learned the contrast to see if she could strengthen the Jedi by understanding what made the Sith so alluring. When you ask Kreia about Atris, she mentions that Atris mirrors a stage of her own past life. Because Atris's path is one I walked long ago, and it is a chapter of my life that has been read and closed. She has taken the first steps, I think. We shall see. Surely you felt the righteous anger? The spoken judgments, the lack of forgiveness. I was a historian once, gathering the relics of the Jedi, learning the ancient mysteries. Always there were more questions. One quickly learns that the Jedi Code does not give all the answers. If you are to truly understand, then you will need the contrast, not adherence to a single idea. That is why Atris and the others blamed me, sentenced me, they believed me responsible for Revan's fall. This is likely how Kai used to be before she joined the Mandalorian Wars. I was a historian, the chronicler of the Jedi. I sought to preserve the knowledge of the Jedi, and to do that I needed to know the Sith in order to stop them. The Jedi were all that seemed left to me, and yet I had become so far removed from them that I betrayed them. In some part of me, I knew I had made choices, compromises, but always for the sake of the Republic, of the galaxy. Kai likely advocated Sith values, such as the value of conflict, which other Jedi Masters despised. 
This was the beginning of her fall from the Jedi Order. During that period, Kai met the Ichani General Yusani and fell in love. When the male exile spars with the handmaiden Brianna, the daughter of Kai, Kreia wonders what would happen if you continued to spar. Never have you wondered what it would mean in the Ichani rituals if the two of you sparred and fought, and you won, completely and utterly? If perhaps she would give in, surrender herself to you? To me, this seems too insightful and personal to be a simple observation. This is likely what happened. Kai sparred with Yusani, repeatedly, then submitted to him and fell in love. Just as her daughter that denounced her oath to Atreus, Kai denounced her oath to the Jedi Order. What Kai did during the war and afterwards is a mystery. She fought under Revan with Yusani, but nothing much is known afterwards. The Jedi Master Kavar and the handmaiden Brianna assumed that Kai had died at Malachor V. I never saw her face, and she did not return from the final battle of the war. She died in the battle that shattered Malachor V. I thought you had died in the Mandalorian Wars. Die? No. Became stronger. Yes. At that point, history becomes even more uncertain. Kai fell deeper to the dark side and despised the Jedi for exiling her. There are no hints of what happened before Kai became known as Darth Treya. During and after the events of the first Knights of the Old Republic game until the beginning of the Knights of the Old Republic 2 game, Treya trained Nihilus and Sion. Nothing is known about the origins of both men other than they were tragedies of the Mandalorian Wars. That is when Darth Treya reached the height of her power. And from that pinnacle of power, she was stripped of her connection to the Force. And it was at that moment that Kreia was born. At that point, it's not entirely known how Kreia escaped death and found the exile. I would like to think that Revan ended up on Malachor V with the Ebon Hawk, and Kreia escaped using the ship. On the Harbinger's log, it reports that the Ebon Hawk was under attack from a Sith warship. It's very likely that he was trying to capture her, and Kreia just happened to find the exile by chance. And that's the events that lead up to the beginning of the game. So this is the basic overview of her long life history. It will be important as a reference of the foundation of Kreia's philosophy. The reasons why Kreia eventually left the Jedi Order gives us a greater understanding of their failings. Just like Atreus, Kreia sought to understand why so many of the greatest of the Jedi fell to the dark side despite their training. The Disciple and the Jedi Master Zezkai El ponder on this point. From the failure of the Masters, from our failure to properly train Jedi, came disaster. And I wondered if perhaps the teachings of the Jedi had been our failing all along. There have been so many failures by teachers who believed in the code with all their being. Master Arka failed Ulik, as Master Boss failed Exar Kun, as Kay and Zar and the others of the Council failed Revan and Malak. For all the acts we do to preserve the galaxy, from such an arrogance that all we do is right and just, I wonder if there is a counter-effect that is created that strikes back at us. Exar Kun, Ulik Keldroma, Malak, Revan, you, all Jedi, there is something wrong in the Force, a wound, a sound that is growing, like a scream. You can hear it echo in Nar Shadda, sometimes when the moon is on orbit. It is a frightening thing to feel, that perhaps being connected to all life is not enlightenment at all, but simply another doom. But the reason the Jedi Civil War was named such was because few in the galaxy can recognize the difference between the Sith and the Jedi. To them, they are both Jedi, with different philosophies. Jedi often fall. They cause much harm on Onderon, for example, in the name of peace and protection. Uleg Keldroma and Exar Kun, the two Dark Lords during the Sith War many decades ago, were once Jedi Knights, as were Revan and Malak. It is perhaps more amazing that some still trust Jedi after many have fallen and endangered the galaxy. It is also proof that a single Force wielder can change the face of the galaxy. And that is a frightening thing indeed. Jedi are not supposed to be like the rest of us. 
They are supposed to see a higher purpose in all things. And they are supposed to train students responsibly and well, so mistakes of the past are not repeated. Yet all I saw was ignorance and arrogance and what those seeds created in the Republic. It is difficult to follow the Jedi Code when so few others have. I harbor doubts concerning the Jedi. Many Jedi defy the Order during the Mandalorian Wars, and it paved the way for the Jedi Civil War. The students made their own choices, as much as the histories tell us. Perhaps I judge the Masters unfairly, yet I still wonder why they did not rise to stop such threats earlier, or if they simply did not see them. Master Arka taught Ulik. Master Baz was the one who saw what Exar Kun could become, but he took no steps to stop him. Master Jar taught Malak, and Revan had many masters, including Jar, Kay, and Dorak. And towards the end of the training, Revan sought out many other teachers to learn certain techniques. And it is said that he went to his first and final master to learn how to leave the Order entirely as she had. And such teachings and their teachers is why I harbor doubts. Why I wonder if something is missing from the Jedi Code. There is no blame. All must accept. But, at its core, one must wonder if it was the failure of the Jedi teachings or the teachers themselves. Many of the Jedi Council trained Exar Kun, Ulik, Revan, and Malak. How could they not see the danger they posed? And if they could not, perhaps there was some essential part of their teachings that was flawed. Something beyond the Jedi Code that they were missing. The Jedi Code does not offer all the answers because it lacks something instinctual to all of life. The axiom that peace can only be obtained if there are no conflict hides a deeper truth. Peace can only be achieved if there is no ego. What the Jedi lack is the ability of being human and finding value in their life. The Jedi understood, maybe unconsciously, that if anyone were allowed to seek conflict, to have adventures, to make friends, love, or just live life, it would lead people down the path to the dark side. Adventure. <laughs> Excitement. <laughs> A Jedi craves not these things. The Jedi cannot permit any to have a sense of pride or desires. They train those who are force sensitive so that they may lock their abilities for the good of the galaxy. They adhere so strongly to the Jedi Code as a suppression of all conflict which only weakens them and doesn't actually prevent some from falling to the dark side. This can be seen as a major failing of the Jedi with Anakin in the prequel movies. Are you allowed to love? I thought that was forbidden for a Jedi. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. And so you might say that we are encouraged to love. Anakin loved Padme and feared losing her like he did with his mother. He went to see Yoda for some counsel, and the only advice that was given was some Buddhist anti-life lessons. Careful you must be when sensing the future, Anakin. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. What must I do, Master Yoda? Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. That's an easy thing to say when you don't value anything to be at peace. Anakin couldn't accept losing Padme because he loved her, and it brought him down the path to the dark side and the destruction of the Jedi Order. I have failed you, Anakin. I have failed you. Forming bonds and having emotional value towards others makes you weaker and susceptible to the dark side, but it also makes you human. This is the lesson that the Jedi do not teach. It is something Jolie Bindo references as well in the first Knights of the Old Republic game. 
The Jedi, with their damnable sense of overcaution, would tell you love is something to avoid. Thankfully, anyone who's even partially alive knows that's not true. Love doesn't lead to the dark side. Passion can lead to rage and fear and can be controlled. But passion is not the same thing as love. Controlling your passions while being in love, that's what they should teach you to beware. But love itself will save you, not condemn you. Love causes pain, certainly. Inevitably, love is going to lead to as much sorrow and regret as it does joy. And how do you deal with the bad part of love is what determines your character. What determines the dark side's hold over you? A life without risk is boring. You want love, you've got to fight for it. The Jedi teach their followers to become automatrons by following the code and lose their connections to humanity in the process. But even through such rigid trainings, human nature persists. It seeks conflict, desires adventures. It wants to exist and live. The greater your connections to life and to others, the more you are susceptible to falling to the dark side. This is echoed with Luke in The Empire Strikes Back when he starts to have visions of his friends being tortured and the possibility of them dying. Luke, you must complete the training. No, I can't keep the vision out of my head. They're my friends. I gotta help them. You must not go. But Han and Leia will die if I don't. Patience. And sacrifice Han and Leia. If you honor what they fight for, yes. And Yoda was right, as it was a trap. But what is interesting is Luke's decision after Vader offers to join forces with him to defeat the Emperor. He follows the Jedi way by sacrificing himself rather than falling to the dark side and causing more suffering. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. The basic principle of altruism is that a person has no right to exist for their own sake and must serve others as the only justification for their existence. With self-sacrifice being the highest moral duty, virtue, and value. Duty is the moral necessity to perform certain actions with no reason other than the obedience of some higher authority and purpose without any regards to personal goals, motives, or desires. The core of altruism is self-destruction in the view that the self is evil, with selflessness being the standard of the good. The Jedi use their power for good. Good is a point of view, Anakin. The Jedi are selfless. They only care about others. After you free Atten from his prison cell on Paragus, the exile has to go down a shaft to find a way back to the Ebon Hawk. Atten warns that it's suicide. One of the dialogue options is saying that a Jedi's life is sacrifice, and therefore, there's nothing to fear. After you escape the station of Paragus, Kreia talks about starting a war with these new Sith. And, again, the Exo has a dialogue option that a Jedi's life is sacrifice. This teaching principle is echoed throughout the game with the Jedi Master Zeskai El on Nar Shadda and the Jedi Master Kavar on Dantooine. A Jedi's life is sacrifice, but we cannot allow our presence or actions to endanger others. A Jedi doesn't care if he dies. Everyone does. But when we fight, when we sacrifice ourselves, it is for others, for the greater good. In Nietzschean terms, the Jedi are the embodiment of slave morality. The essence of slave morality is utility for unity, the good that is the most useful to the whole community at the expense of the individual. Another way of seeing this is that the Jedi are apathetic to the suffering of all life in the galaxy and only help out out of obligation when they are nearby, not because they want to change anything or help. The Jedi are preventing a greater evil by not using their power to mold the galaxy as they see fit. If we look at the Jedi from a lifelong linear experience, it gives a greater overview of how the Jedi teaching are anti-life. At a very young age, the Jedi remove children that are Force-sensitive from their families so that they may not form connections with their parents. The Jedi separate children from their parents. It is because family exerts a powerful influence on one's development. Some people were surprised that the Jedi initially rejected Anakin to be trained when he was only nine years old. He is too old. It made sense for Yoda to reject Luke as he was already an adult. He is too old. 
Yes. Too old to begin the training. But even Anakin, at his age, was too old? The Jedi Council correctly sensed that Anakin had already formed connections with his mother and feared losing her. See through you. We can. Be mindful of your feelings. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. I miss her. Afraid to lose her, I think, hmm? What has that got to do with anything? Everything! Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The key point is emotional bonds. The younglings grow up with their first memories being with the Jedi, only knowing the Jedi way, never forming any connections, learning the higher mysteries of the Force and its techniques. They become Zen, losing their ego, forgoing any selfish desires to never succumb to the dark side, teach a new generation this process, and then die of old age. What kind of life is that? It's such a waste of life and their time alive. By teaching their students never to value their life, never seeking any selfish desires, and to accept their death as a natural part of life, the Jedi Code destroys human nature. I do not want to train you to be a Jedi Knight. I want you to learn to be human. You would assume that the Sith are more humane than the Jedi by being more individualistic, but ironically, they're even worse. Their failing is that they become so consumed by their lust for power that they forget why they fell to the dark side in the first place, becoming monsters that bring doom to the galaxy. But throughout that quest for power, what have the Sith achieved? What changes or value have they brought to the galaxy? Nothing. This rise and fall of the Sith is a life story that is echoed many times in the Star Wars canon. The pull of the dark side is that once you fall, you become unaware that you desire more power for the sake of power until you become an agent of evil. In the first Knights of the Old Republic game, you can talk with the Sith Utara Bands about her past. She reveals her life story about how she joined the Sith. I'm originally from Slaheron, if you must know. I was a slave to a cruel master, Omish the Hutt. The Huts control everything on Sleheron, and a slave is nothing to them. I was determined not to be nothing. One night when the drunken worm had me alone in his chambers, I stabbed him and escaped the compound. I stole onto a cargo ship and was not discovered by the crew until they reached the next system. They left me for dead on a desolate planetoid, alone. But that was fine by me. I was glad to be anywhere other than Sahiran. It was not luck that I was eventually rescued, of course. The Force was strong with me, though I didn't know that at the time. Not until the Jedi told me, that is. They took me in and trained me, even though I was a bit older than most Padawan. I never progressed beyond Padawan. I had discipline, but no peace. And after my treatment at the hands of the Huts, there was little room in me for the ways of the Jedi. I wanted to use the Force to free the other slaves I knew, to fight for what I knew was right. The Jedi restrained me until I couldn't stand it anymore. They claim the dark side is evil, but that isn't so. Sometimes anger and hatred are so deserved and right. Sometimes things change because of it. Being a Sith doesn't make me a monster, however. There is suffering and injustice in the universe. I am surprised the Jedi can even stand the stench of it, much less stand by and do nothing. Any failure to get the results I want is due to a lack of power on my part. That can change in time. But my anger has not diminished, nor my desire to see change. The more time I spend with the Sith, the more I am certain that one day I will be able to fight as I must. She remained trapped, trying to become the next leader of the Sith Academy for more power rather than achieve her dreams. All the things I wanted to do, all the wrongs I wanted to right, I haven't done any of it. They just get farther and farther from my mind. All I've cared about is power. And myself, this isn't the person I was. This is echoed similarly with Anakin when he joined the Sith to prevent the visions of Padme's death. After committing his path down the dark side by killing the younglings and eradicating the Separatist leaders, Padme tried to bring him back from the dark side, but it was already too late. You turned to the dark side? That you killed younglings? Anakin, all I want is your love. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. At what cost? You're a good person. Don't do this. I won't lose you the way I lost my mother. 
I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of. And I'm doing it for you. To protect you. Come away with me. Help me raise our child. Leave everything else behind while we still can. Don't you see? We don't have to run away anymore. I have brought peace to the Republic. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I, I can overthrow him. And together, you and I can rule the galaxy. Make things the way we want them to be. I don't believe what I'm hearing. Obi-Wan was right. You've changed. I don't know you anymore. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. You're going down a path I can't follow. Because of Obi-Wan. Because of what you've done. What you plan to do. There is an alternative ending in the Revenge of the Sith game where Anakin won his duel against Obi-Wan on Mustafar. It shows his further descent towards the dark side and his desire of being in control. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! You underestimate the power of the dark side. Don't try it! She belongs to me. This is part of what Kreia understood when she lost her power and connection to the Force. She squabbled to obtain power for years, had the ability to change whatever she desired, and in the end, she lost everything and changed nothing. I wielded power like you cannot imagine. Everything I saw was awash with possibilities, spreading outwards, touching everything else. I saw all of that, all that the Force is. And only when it was ripped from me did I truly see it. In Nietzschean terms, the Sith are the embodiment of Master Morality. The essence of Master Morality is individual strength that promotes power and influence. Another way of seeing this is that the Sith only care about themselves and consider everything that furthers their power to be good while anything that diminishes their power to be bad. There's nothing wrong with seeking power, as it is the nature of all life to impose their will on the world. But when you amass yourself among people who only seek power for the sake of power, rather than seeking progress or to change anything, it becomes self-destructive to the point where nothing is achieved. I had a name once. Ajunta Paul. Yes, that was my name. I was one of many. We were servants of the dark side. Sith Lords, we called ourselves. So proud. We hid from the Jedi, but it was not they who destroyed us. Is it not obvious what we did? We destroyed each other. We desired the secrets of each other to increase our power. We battled until finally our fortress rained down on top of us. The ancient Sith destroyed each other. The fundamental flaw in their philosophy, one would think. I suppose that's the nature of the dark side. Power, but no longevity. Eventually it just consumes itself. The Sith respect order and control, that is true. But few of them seem ever able to hold that power for long. To see their philosophy at work is like watching a continual collapse, just like watching their academy fall in on itself. The Sith, as an ideology, is unsustainable and leads to death rather than overall improvement. 
and as a continual lifestyle, it is vain and does not provide any amount of peace. This lack of fulfillment is heavily reflected with Sion. His only goal was to destroy the Jedi and bring pain to the galaxy. After you defeat him on Malachor V, you can ask him, was it worth it? And he tells you the truth. It was not. No matter how many I killed, there was no end to the pain. The blades the Force tore through my flesh. I am glad to leave this place at last. Near the end of the game, if you take the dark side path and kill all the Jedi Masters then go to Dantooine, Kraya will ask you a simple question that you cannot avoid. I must know if killing them, if revenge brought you any measure of satisfaction, if seeing them dead has settled the disquiet within you, because it matters to me in a way that never mattered to the Jedi, to the Council. I did not wish the Jedi dead. Defeated, perhaps. I merely wished them to see that they and their teachings were wrong, that one could not truly understand the Force simply by adhering to the Jedi Code. All I have ever trained have been failures to them. Students who went to fight the Mandalorians, who fell to the dark side, who abandoned their training. Let us return to my question. If, by killing these Jedi, if you achieved any measure of peace. Whichever option you select, the answer is essentially the same. No, I have not obtained peace. There are still more people to fight, to kill. It was as I thought. You have failed me, completely and utterly. I have taught you to hear the Force again, shown you the contrast, and yet still you do not understand. This is what you have wrought. Countless murderers, slayers, assassins, born of war that has, as always, taught the wrong lesson. You showed them life without the Force, and instead of showing them truth, power, all you showed them was how the galaxy may die. Even now, events spiral towards destruction, and there is nothing that can be done because you refuse to listen, to understand. Yet it is for nothing. To have the Jedi Masters brought low by such a failure, there is no victory in that. You have not heard a thing I have taught, and for all I have said, you have never learned to listen. So, now that we have a complete understanding of the failings of the Jedi and Sith, Kreia's philosophy becomes much more poignant now that we can understand what she tried to teach the Exile and, by extension, the player. The core value of Kreia's philosophy are rather simple, as she advocates many of the Sith teachings. All that talk of hatred, manipulation, and standing on your own two feet? Sorry, you don't get any more Sith than that. Still, if we were all judged by who we were in the past, I don't think you'd understand who we are now. However, it would be foolish to simply classify her as a Sith, considering she doesn't identify as either a Jedi nor Sith. Does it matter? Of course it does. Such titles allow you to break the galaxy into light and dark, categorize it. Perhaps I am neither, and I hold both as what they are, pieces of a whole. The only way to comprehend what she stood for is to examine her interactions and observations throughout the game. At the beginning of the story, on Proagus, Kreo only wishes to escape the clutches of Scion and to protect the exile. I came to warn you, Jedi. You know not what path you walk. She doesn't say anything of substance regarding her philosophy, as survival is the only thing that matters at this point. After escaping, Kreo offers herself to be a teacher to the exile. Our link may have had other consequences. Perhaps you can hear the Force again, distantly, through me. If so, then there is hope. I may be able to teach you train you to feel the force again. The threat we face is grave. If you cannot defend yourself, then we have already lost. I offer to train you to become strong again, to know the ways of the force, and to hear the force sing within you as it once did. Whenever I travel with you, I shall impart what I can to you through my words and presence. Upon landing on Telos, you are placed under house arrest for blowing up a solar system and are given two possible paths to take. You can help the weak Etorians that promise to help you in very vague terms, 
or you can work with the Galaxy Spawning Conglomerate that will reward you with wealth. Let's side with the Etorians, as it is the faction that is considered to be the light side path. The Etorians are weak, with grand plans to heal the planet from a passive attack by restoring and reviving the ecosystem, but they lack strength to impose their will. As such, they beg you to help them over the Zerka Corporation. However, Kreia doesn't approve of the relationship. I do not approve of this alliance we have formed with Chodo Habat and his Ithorians. Habat has an agenda, and he hopes to tie you into it to use you to his own ends. Its speech is filled with maybes, and perhaps it makes promises of healing, while the world under its care burns and dies. You should heed my advice. It would be best if you avoided such needless entanglements. You do all their quests without any reward for your work, and then you obtain your ship. But then, just as you're about to fly away to the northern area, you get a message from their herd that they're being attacked by Zerka mercenaries. Because they're weak, they're completely reliant on you to survive. And this is weakness. You have no obligations to save them. You can just ignore them and fly away. There is an equal lesson if you decide to work with Zerka instead of the Etorians. You conduct illegal dealings, lie and steal from the Etorians, do jobs for the Galactic Mafia the Exchange, all for monetary compensation. Unlike the Etorians, Kreia doesn't disapprove because you are being compensated for your strength. However, it should be noted that money is a tool for exchanging good and services, so relying on it as a source of power is weakness. Zerka relies on its will to enforce their might on Telos by hiring mercenaries. This is weakness because it can only buy influence from those who have strength rather than rely on their own. When the mercenaries decide to storm the offices of Zerka for more money, the head of the company is powerless to stop them. Be reasonable, Lorso. You really aren't in a position to take such a negative view to our demands. We're not asking for much. Do you feel in charge? I've paid you a small fortune. And this gives you power over me? You have wonderful timing. I had my reservations about some of these mercenaries, but I had hoped that CSD would be able to keep them in line. It appears that I was wrong. These two paths echo the lesson of strength that Kreia advocates from the Sith. Do not rely on others as the source of your power build your own strength. Another planet of importance, Nar Shadda, is a great microcosm for Kreia's philosophy because it is a lawless planet where only the strong can strive. Everyone is squabbling for any amount of power. Mercenaries and bounty hunters roam around, and the weak fear the strong. You have to find a hidden Jedi Master on a planet of billions, and the plot will only progress if you do enough quests by causing a lot of trouble. But before you can start, there is an unavoidable event of great interest at the beginning of the map that has become an iconic moment in the game. I saw what you did to those exchange thugs, stranger. Can you spare a few credits, maybe help another refugee in need? Forgive me, stranger, but if, if you had some credits you could spare, it would, it would be a great help. Please. The first option is to give in to charity, while the second option is to indulge in your psychotic urges to scare the homeless man away. Whichever option you select, Korea will scorn you. If you choose the light side option, she will complain that being altruistic without thinking is bad. Thank you, stranger. I won't forget your kindness. Why did you do such a thing? Such kindnesses will mean nothing. His path is set. Giving him what he has not earned is like pouring sand into his hands. What if by surviving another day he brings a greater darkness upon another? The slightest push, the smallest touch, sends echoes throughout life. Even an act of kindness may have more severe repercussions than you know or can see. By giving him something he has not earned, perhaps all you have helped him become is a target. Seeing another elevated often brings the eyes of others who suffer. And perhaps in the end, all you have wrought is more pain. And that is my lesson to you. Be careful of charity and kindness, lest you do more harm with open hands than with a clenched fist.
Korea is not advocating against charity. She simply wants you to understand how inconsequential aid can affect others, even if you try to do good. The dark side option also has its criticism from Kreia. Forgive me, stranger, please. I beg you, do not kill me. Why did you do such a thing? Giving into your feelings over such a small matter, they would be better served elsewhere. The smallest push, the smallest touch, sends echoes throughout life. These acts of cruelty may have more severe repercussions than you know or can see. Cruelty leads to suffering, and when one suffers, it is the way of life to spread suffering. The suffering within builds until its sound is all one hears. And when a kindness is offered, it is punished, and a greater darkness is served. From one act can come tremendous power when the echo has traveled as far as it can. Send a great echo, and power will come to you. The day shall come when you can test your strength, I promise you. Again. Kreia is not saying that you shouldn't indulge in your passions, but that you should only do so when it is worthwhile and useful. Mind what I have said. Use your power, but in its proper place. After that encounter, you have the rest of Narshara as your playground to stir up trouble. Upon entering the marketplace, the exile begins to feel the current of life of all the people living on Narshada. Your thoughts are disturbed. I can feel them like a shiver running through you. It is Narshada, the true Narshada that you feel around you. It is this moon, with the metal and machines stripped away and the currents of the force laid bare. What you feel is the echo of the minds of these creatures within the force. Their anger, their greed, their desperation. It is life. It is but the vibration of minds driven by life's struggles. The struggle to feed, to take, to mate, to fight. It is the way of things. There is an interesting dialogue option on whether it is possible to move the masses, and Kreia offers an interesting answer. One might as well move the universe, but such manipulation is possible, yes. It requires that one be able to feel the critical point within the fractured mass, and know how to strike it in such a way that the echoes travel to your intended destination. The ability to fool the minds of others, to dominate them on a massive scale that you speak of, is not achieved best through raw power. Manipulation is done through propelling events, or selected ones, into motion. It is done through teaching, through example, and through conviction. And the greatest of victories are not manipulations at all, but simply awakening others to the truth of what you believe, of hearing it echoed around you in life. But let us be silent. Words and thoughts are distractions. Feel this moment for as long as it will last. Feel life as it is, with the crude matter stripped away. Manipulation is arguably one of the most undefined aspects of Kreia's philosophy, as it is something that cannot be taught, only learned instinctively, then understood rationally. Let's focus on the refugee center, as it holds an important lesson on manipulation. On Narshada, there's a large bounty placed on the Jedi. The Intergalactic Crime Syndicate, the Exchange, have clamped down hard on the refugees in an attempt to break their will. Initially, there doesn't seem to be any reason for such a horrible treatment, but it's later revealed that the Exchange is doing this to draw up the Jedi into helping the refugees. Obviously, if you start helping the refugees like a goody two-shoes, Kreia will start to scorn you. I'm feeling a little better. Thank you. And what is it you think you have accomplished? If you seek to aid everyone that suffers in the galaxy, you will only weaken yourself and weaken them. It is the internal struggles, when fought and won on their own, that yield the strongest rewards. You stole that struggle from them, cheapened it. The currents of the galaxy, of nations, of peoples, may all stem from such small kindnesses. Every small weakness, small fracture that you create weakens the whole. If you care for others, then dispense with pity and sacrifice, and recognize the value in letting them fight their own battles. And when they triumph, they will be even stronger for the victory. There is an interesting side quest that reinforces this lesson. In the refugee landing pad, you'll find Lutra that is searching for his lost love. For a minute, I thought you might have been someone else. My wife, Ada. There's a chance she may be here on Nar Shaddaa. 
A lot of refugees ended up here after the Jedi Civil War. I came here to see if I could track her down. Thing is, I can't get into the refugee sector. The Exchange has got the place barricaded with thugs. They're putting the squeeze on the whole sector, trying to crush the spirit out of the remaining refugees. Now I'm almost cleaned out. I burned the last of my fuel and my freight just getting here. I've been here for weeks, hoping to see her face. Upon finding his lover and reuniting them, Kreia is dismissive of having helped them. Aida, I didn't think I'd ever find you. I can't believe you're here before me. The destruction of Telos? I can't even tell you what happened after, being shuttled from system to system barely one planet ahead of the Sith fleet. Shh. We can talk about it later. You have my thanks, stranger. I can only hope you have as much luck at what you're looking for. It would have been better had he found her on his own. By aiding him, you have only weakened him. He was at a moment of crisis, a moment of indecision. It is those internal struggles when they are fought and won that yield the strongest rewards. You took that battle from him, cheapened it. If he truly loved her, truly, he would have entered the refugee sector on his own. Damn the exchange, damn everything in his path, and taken her. You have made their union easier, not better. If you care for them, then dispense with pity and sacrifice, and recognize the value in letting them fight their own battles. And when they triumph, they will be even stronger for the victory. What Kreo wishes to teach is not that you should help others, but that if people are unable to help themselves, you can manipulate them by using them to create echoes that benefit you. It is only from such small things, from such critical points, that the universe and its masses may be moved. That is why you must indulge them and indulge yourself. It is not aiding them that matters, but using them as forges against which you temper yourself. Use their dependency, feed upon it, until you have exhausted them, then leave them. So, returning to the refugees, despite their miserable conditions, they still cling to hope. Welcome, traveler. My name's Husef. I try to look out for the other refugees. You've got the Serico refugees over on the Skyward side. They're veterans from the Serico campaign and don't take kind to strangers. And on the inner side, you've got the Overseer and his exchange. They've been pushing us refugees pretty hard lately. Occasionally, their thugs kidnap people and sell them into slavery with the huts. They've also hemmed us in. We used to live all throughout this area, but they've crammed us all in here now. They're trying to break our spirit so that we'll become slave workers for the huts. This may be an opportunity for us. If we can make life miserable enough for the refugees, they will capitulate. The exchange will be a valuable ally to us. I won't succumb to the exchange. We have children here, with bright futures. We can't give up. Walking around the refugee area, you'll find a sick man in a corner, suffering from what he assumes is to be the plague. Keep back. I am ill. Contagious, the others say. Unlike the typical knee-jerk Jedi response to heal without thought, you can convince him to kill himself using guilt. I suppose I will die soon, anyway. Oh. Elsewhere, in a refugee area, a mother is weeping, begging you to return her daughter that has been kidnapped. Are you one of Saquesh's men? Did you take my daughter? Don't you work with Saquesh? He took my daughter, Adana, to sell to the huts. All because I told him I could not pay his tribute. I owe 600 credits. Now, you could pay her debts, but if you seek out to help out everyone, you'll be penniless almost immediately. So, you can persuade her to sell herself into slavery. That way, at least she'll be with her daughter. Yes, I suppose that is one way we can stay together. Oh, this is terrible. This is so terrible. <laughs> but I must be with Adana. After convincing these two, the refugee leader will become depressed and will cave in to the demands of the exchange. How could you give Nada to the exchange like that? Oh, these are terrible times for us. Look how grim our situation is. Another refugee, old Gariel, died. There's no hope left for us. I will speak with the overseer. Achieving this will result a hand of applause by Kreia. Well executed. You have created an echo, something that will travel for some time. You are learning much. Forcing the refugees to capitulate will almost immediately grab the attention of the exchange, as well as the Jedi Master you're seeking. By examining how all the threads affect each other, you have become closer to your goal without having to do much. That 
is the lesson of manipulation. Now, this might bring up some obvious moral questions, but Cray would simply tell you to ignore them. You weaken yourself by pretending that morality is important to you. You must learn to recognize your true self. If you are significantly down the path to the dark side and find the Jedi Master on Nar Shada, the Wookiee Hanhar will be added to the party. Awaken, beast. I have saved your life, beast. That makes it mine. Kneel. Because there is something to be learned of strength, beast, even within your empty shell, and it will be needed in the times ahead. The beast is a lesson in strength. Learn that lesson, then you will understand. He is life at its most primitive. And he represents what happens when civilization comes to primates. The beast's strength is prodigious, and you can learn much from it. Speak with him. Discern his nature. Perhaps then it will become clear. When speaking to Hanhar, he explains to you the customs of the Wookiees regarding life debts. In a way, life debts are a form of slavery, but of the mind, that bind a person into servitude. In his madness, Hanhar killed his tribe to save them from becoming slave to others. It's the reason why he wears shackles around his wrists. If you ask him why he doesn't simply abandon his codes, he answers that he cannot. He would no longer be a part of his tribe. He would have to create his own codes, his own values, based on nothing, and that is something he cannot do. As the exile remarks, to face such oblivion, to stand firm in your own conviction and belief, free of ready-made codes, that is the lesson of strength. If you become a slave to codes or an ideology, then your entire being is dictated by categorical imperatives, abstract notions of your mind. It means to live by pure ideology, to the point where you no longer have selfish values or desires, as though you're no longer alive. This is represented beautifully with Zalbar near the end of the first Knights of the Old Republic game where he has to choose whether to uphold his life debt or to side with his best friend. I saw what the Sith did to Terrace. Anyone who serves the dark side is evil. Big Z and I are with Karth on this one. <coughs> Zalbar, it's not betrayal if you break your life debt now. No, Zalbar, I don't care. I won't help the Sith against the Republic. Not for anything. Not even for you. I'm not just gonna stand aside and do nothing. You'll... you'll just have to kill me. But I don't think you will. Not if I don't attack you first. Selbert, uh, 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 uh. what are you saying? It's me, Big Z. Mission. <laughs> Upon returning to Kreia, you tell her your discovery. Hanhar is strong, yet he is powerless. Raw strength is nothing compared to the will of the mind. Ah, you are a perceptive one indeed. In this instance, you are correct. All that strength, that anger, yet it is held in check, restrained by his beliefs, his doubt. Everyone is made up of events in their past, and it forms walls around one's spirit, or breaks such walls down. The mind makes some powerless, and gives strength to others. He walks, but he is dead. It is because he is not ready to give up his ties yet. It is much like Jedi who will not give up their code. It is to surrender yourself, to make yourself a slave to a teaching or belief that makes it so that belief will always rule you. The lesson is about volition. The power to use your will, which is equally as important as obtaining power. Never live for the sake of another or an ideology. Live for yourself. And if you do believe in an ideology, then find its opposite, so that you may reinforce it by correcting its flaws. 
become what strengthens an ideology, not a slave to it by following it dogmatically. To believe in an ideal is to be willing to betray it. It is something no Sith or Jedi has ever truly learned. That is the lesson of strength. After Kreia explains this lesson, she introduces a final test to the player directly to see if they've understood her philosophy. Yet that is not the only lesson that the beast can teach us. Not only does one's will control one's strength, but one's will can control and draw upon the strength of others. Surely you have felt the beast's presence on board this ship, stalking, restless. It is a more primal connection you feel, and the hunger you feel does not stem from Han Ha. It is something you may draw upon, his very life if need be. He does not realize how deeply his life debt runs, but he will. When you suffer, call upon that hunger, and the beast shall be that upon which your will may draw strength. Reach out, feel his presence within the ship, clawing at you, pacing. Feel the rumbling of the hull, the metal around you like a cage, and the building anger, the blood that rises behind the eyes, a bloodlust that cannot be sated. If you accept it, you will find your strength increase and your vitality return to you faster with every breath. Accepting this power will give a permanent plus two to your strength. Good. You know it now. The predator-prey relationship. The strong feeding on the weak. It will serve you. More power is always good, right? If you've understood anything about Kreia and her philosophy, then the answer should be obvious. But it is a choice that few people have ever made while playing this game. Most accept this gift, blindly, without understanding the true lesson of strength. Cray will ask why you would reject such an offer. Are you sure? It will grant you strength, vitality for the times ahead. Forsake it, deny it, and you will deny power. The answer given foreshadows a decision made on Malachor V and why the exile is so important to the Star Wars canon. Ah, and that is the choice of Malachor V at last. You have made a strange choice. A unique choice. Very well, I accept it. And know that that is the true lesson of strength, to turn away from strength that is not your own. And if you're curious whether this was a test, the exile wonders the exact same thing. I'm always testing you, never forget that. Always be on your guard, otherwise you may learn something. The rest of the planets, Korban, Duxin, Onderon, they do not have any interesting moments involving Kreia that reflect her philosophy. As such, they can be ignored and we can move on to the final parts of the story that have a greater focus on what she stood for and her motivations. After confronting and defeating Atris, you can ask her what she thinks is Kreia's motivation. She seeks the death of all Jedi, all Sith, and the death of the Force. It is madness. It is impossible. While it is true that Kreia seeks the destruction of the Jedi, the Sith, and the Force, it is simply a means to an end to her actual goal. At the end of the game, on Malachor V, Kreia explains how she used the Exile to accomplish her goals. From the moment you awoke, I have used you. I used you to gather the Jedi so they could be destroyed. I used you to reveal Atrus's corruption so that her teaching could be ended before it began. I used you to keep the Lords of the Sith from condemning the galaxy to death with their power unchecked. If you go down the path to the dark side and kill all the Jedi Masters, Kreia explains that they needed to be killed, but does not provide an answer why. The destruction of the Order, the Masters, it was not an end in itself. I did not expect them to still live. Their presence was knowledge I did not possess. But now this has been corrected, and now the sides of this conflict are as I had thought them to be. There are no more unknowns. Regardless, it had to be done to have such powerful Jedi still live, still be felt in the Force, even on such worlds as they had chosen, was a threat that had to be ended. The true reason Kreia sought the destruction of the Jedi Order was to correct the mistakes of the past so that they wouldn't happen again in the future. After the destruction of these new Sith, if many of the Jedi Masters still lived, the Jedi Order would be rebuilt without any change. The true failing of the Jedi is that they are blind, reject any desire for conflict, unwilling to change or grow. Jolie Bindo even references this point about how the Jedi are fallible, 
You know what I hate? Well, you know, lots of things really, but I'm old and easily annoyed, but that's besides the point. What I really hate are how most people view the Jedi. Everyone thinks that the Jedi are perfect, that they can do no wrong. They think the Jedi Council is completely incapable of injustice. And I'm not even talking about how some of us fall to the dark side. No, that's plenty indication of our fallibility, but it's something else entirely. No, I'm talking about how more than often not, your average robe-wearing Jedi can try to do the right thing and still be completely wrong. <sighs> I guess I'm not being clear, am I? Come to think of it, I don't have to be clear. Someone my age is entitled to ramble, damn it! But for your sake, I'll try to explain. I'll tell you a little tale about a Jedi Master I once knew. Hortath, I think. Or was it Hortoff? Oh, oh yes, Master Hortath. He was a kindly old Jedi who meant well, but the most nearsighted thing in the core, I swear. He would walk into walls, knock over tables, mistake apprentices for rancor beasts, that sort of thing. And he was too proud to submit to proper treatment. Some used to counsel him in the urge to use the Force, Master Hordath. Allow the Force to see for you. But he refused to believe that his eyes were failing. He simply squinted more and more as the years went on, the other Jedi resignedly passing it off as the amusing quirk of a compassionate old man. So, one day a young Padawan meets Master Hordath in the courtyard and... Not knowing of his blindness, asks him for directions to the council. Quite sure of himself, Hordath gave the lad directions, which happened to lead back outside and away from the Enclave. The Padawan is confused, naturally, and he asks if Master Hordath is sure, and of course Master Hordath says that he is. The Padawan suggests that perhaps he should ask someone else, but the proud Hordath now feels insulted. He tells the Padawan to take the route he prescribed and no other. Rather dejectedly, the Padawan did as he was told, and so ended up leaving the Jedi Order forever. It was decided that the boy's fate was to leave the Order anyway, though whether that was out of respect for Hordath or because the boy went on to something else, well, we'll never know. The tale is about blindness, and I thought the point was clear. At any rate, you think about it. If you take the light side path and bring the Jedi Masters to Dantooine, they reveal the reason why they exiled the exile. When you returned to us, we saw what had happened. You carry all those deaths at Malachor within you, and it has left a hole, a hunger that cannot be filled. In you, we saw a wound in the Force. In you, we saw the end of the Force. You are a cipher, forming bonds, leeching the life of others, siphoning their will and dominating them. Within you, we see something worse than merely the teachings of the Sith. What you carry may mean the death of the Force and the death of the Jedi. And that is why you are a threat to us all. What if other Jedi went to war as you did, suffered the same events and emerged as you did? What if there was a crucible that trained such Jedi to consume and kill? For you, Malachor was that crucible. And so you have brought about the end of the Jedi and perhaps all the knowledge of the Force... But it is of no consequence. Rather than seeking to understand the reasons why the Exile became that way and to correct their ways, they chose to remain blind and to ignore the issue entirely. You are a threat to living creatures and all who feel the Force. And that we cannot allow. Our judgment before remains. Exile. You must leave. And you must leave without your tie to the Force. It is a punishment reserved for only a few, and only when necessary. But we have the power to cut you off from the Force, and it must be done. Forgive us, but it is necessary. Enough! What? Step away! He has brought truth, and you condemn it? The arrogance! However, it is only by understanding why Korea desired to destroy Atris and the Sith that the destruction of the Jedi is given greater context to her overall goal. As mentioned previously, Atris mirrors a stage of Kreia's past life when she was known as Eren Kai and began to learn more about the Sith to strengthen the Jedi Order. I am Atris, Jedi Master, the last historian of the Jedi, the last of the Jedi. Those are titles, words you cling to as the darkness falls around you. You are that which has attacked the Jedi. You are Sith. 
Sith is a title, yes, but like you, the title is not who I am. It is not what I believe. For you, it is different. You have bathed in the knowledge of the Sith. But there is not enough truth in such teachings. But it will be a step for you. You have gathered Sith holocrons, Sith teachings from across the galaxy. It is why you have chosen servants who cannot feel the Force. And most importantly, they cannot feel what you have become. I have sought to preserve the Jedi Order, and I have gathered all that I know of the Sith to this place, so I might find them and stop them. How did it happen? Search your heart. It was never battle that called to you, never battle that caused you to fall. Alakor V has touched many things, and it casts its echoes still. It is such a quiet thing to fall, but far more terrible is to admit it. Disgusted about how the Jedi did not live up to her ideals, Atris desired to train better Jedis after the Sith were destroyed. Who are these Jedi who survived the Jedi Civil War? They are not the Jedi I know, the ones I once worshipped. They are cowards, and doubters, and afraid. What manner of Jedi hide from a threat? Who turn on their own, and imprison them on dead worlds? When the Sith are destroyed, then I shall rebuild the Jedi Order again. They shall have none of the weaknesses of before. They shall be strong, willing to take battle to any who oppose them and weaken the Republic. They shall not train those who are easily corrupted. No more students that will bring war and hate to the galaxy. However, if Atrus were allowed to rebuild the Jedi Order, she would have corrupted the Jedi into Sith. The Exile even has a dialogue option, pointing out this observation. The Sith are the Jedi, the Jedi are the Sith. The Sith and the Jedi are similar in almost every way, including their quest for greater power. And while Revan is considered to be one of the greatest Force users in the Star Wars canon, this was not enough for Kreia because she sought something more. When the Exile enters the tomb on Korriban, visions appear of the Exile's past and what could have been. At the end of the tomb, an alternate version of the Exile can be seen alongside Revan that accepted power on Malachor V rather than cut all ties to the Force. After the Exile defeats the evil version of itself, Revan unleashes his double lightsaber, ready for combat. What is important to note is the color of the lightsaber. Blue is typically the color of the Jedi, while red is the color of the Sith. However, there is a single exception that happened by pure chance while Lucas was explaining this concept to Samuel L. Jackson. I'm trying to figure out who we had to talk to about your light color, your lightsaber color. Oh, well, good guys are good guys are green and blue, bad guys are red. That's just the way it works. No purple left? You, you might get purple. A combination of blue and red creates the synthesis of purple. The casting of Mace Windu equally reflects the lightsaber color. Samuel L. Jackson typically plays aggressive and overly angry characters, and in the prequel movies, he's also playing that same role, but forced to be passive. On Wikipedia, the expanded universe lore describes Mace Windu as being able to fight aggressively without falling to the dark side. His fighting style highlights his inner darkness that lets him walk the line between the light and the dark while still being in control. But going back to Revan, one of his lightsaber is purple, showing a synthesis of the Jedi and Sith. However, on his other hand, he holds a red lightsaber, showing that Revan is firmly among the Sith. The true failing of Atris is that rather than improve the Jedi, she would have corrupted them into Sith in an effort to preserve the techniques and teachings of how to command the Force. What matters is that they be preserved. All the law, all the teachings brought to a new generation. I am the last of the Jedi, and I will show them this truth. Bring it to the galaxy. Remember back to your early teachings. All who gain power are afraid to lose it, even the Jedi. The destruction of the Sith, however, is much more straightforward and obvious. The Sith indulge in their passions, destroying their humanity to obtain more power and become agents of evil that bring ruin to the galaxy. The further you use the Force as a tool, corrupting it for your own selfish goals, the more it eats you up on the inside. This can be seen with the yellow eyes of the Sith, the windows to the soul. 
The Sith rely on their passion for their strength. They think inwards only about themselves. The true failing of the Sith is that they strongly rely on the Force as the source of their strength rather than themselves. This weakness is exemplified with Nihilus and Sion that saw Kreia's teaching as weakness and betrayed her. I sense you, my master. Faint. Weak. Your senses betray you, as you betrayed me. After all that's happened, still you live. You are difficult to kill. For one as limited as you, perhaps. To have fallen so far and learned nothing, that is your failing. The failure is yours. No longer do your whispers crawl within my skull. No longer do I suffer beneath teachings that weaken us. Sion and Nihilus both cannot live without the Force or they would die. Nihilus has amassed so much Force that he hungers for more and would have ended up eating the entire galaxy. He, if he can truly be called a man any longer, is one of the Dark Lords that pursues you. He is one who has learned the greatest of the Sith teachings, and it enslaved him. He is a breach in the Force, capable of consuming the lives of those around him. One cannot have power of that magnitude and still think and perceive the universe as we do, as most of us do. And it devours him as he devours others. His mere presence kills all around him, slowly feeding him. He is already dead. It is simply a question of how many he kills before he falls. Do not think of his power as one would a weapon or one of your warships of the Republic. It is terrible, but it is still a subtle thing. And that is why they and their techniques must be wiped out. No one again must experience and learn what her master did. Instead of sending one's will through connections in the Force, instead such connections are drawn upon, fed upon, and drained completely. Then you understand how terrible such a power is, and why it must be ended it is an empty road to the dark side, and by traveling it, the price is death before one's time. It is not something he can direct or focus, much like hunger itself. He is more of a hole in the force than a living thing. There is no strength in the hunger he possesses, and the will behind his power is a primal thing. And it rules him, not the other way around. It has its own will, its own instincts, and he cares nothing for the Sith or its teachings, or the Jedi. And when the Jedi are dead, her master will feed on the galaxy, the Republic, and eventually consume the Sith as well. There is no future in the empty galaxy he sees, and that is why he must be stopped. The breach must be sealed before his power grows beyond what even we can hope to stop. And Sion seeks to destroy the Jedi as his only purpose in life, but needs the Force to remain alive. He is literally telekinetically holding himself together by force of will, using the force. Of pain, he has learned much. Of knowledge, of teaching, he knows nothing. Like the others, he was spawned by the horrors of the Mandalorian Wars. He exists solely to spread his pain to all Jedi everywhere. While Nihilus and Sion represent the best aspects of the Sith, power and will to power, they also represent the greatest weakness of the Sith, the loss of will by desiring power and the impotence of creating anything beyond destroying the Jedi. This is all because they rely on the Force as their source of their strength, rather than in themselves. Explain something to me. Well, Jedi are supposed to be tough, capable. Yes, and what are they without the Force? Take the greatest Jedi Knight, strip away the Force, and what remains? They rely on it, depend on it more than they know. Watch as one tries to hold a blaster, as they try to hold a lightsaber, and you will see nothing more than a woman, or a man, a child. I guess I didn't realize how much they relied on it. Do not be surprised. In many ways, even you are more capable than a Jedi. You could survive where they could not, simply because you do not hear the Force as they do. It is irony of a sort. A good analogy is to compare the Force with a blade, a tool that can further your strength and obtain victories if you use it correctly. The difference, of course, is that anything is possible with the Force. Nothing is impossible with the Force. It is an energy that flows through all living things. And like energy, 
It may be harnessed, channeled, and consumed at times. It may even be a substance that can burn and ignite. With that blade, you might never face any hardships and can be considered to be powerful. However, relying on the blade is weakness that can be exploited. Your entire livelihood is dependent on the well-being of the sword. If it broke or if some thief stole the blade, you would become worthless overnight. There is no life without the Force. The Force is a blade. Without it, one is defenseless. The dependency the Jedi and the Sith have with the Force is the true source of motivation for Kreia. The problem lies directly in the axioms of their codes. While the first lines of both codes are axiom dichotomies of selflessness for the Jedi and selfishness for the Sith, it is actually the last line of their codes that provide their overall failing concerning their dependency on the Force. The Jedi line, there is no death, there is the Force, taken as literal, means that your life does not exist. You do not live, you do not die, you are simply an extension of the Force. This is why the Jedi preach self-sacrifice and the dismissal of one's life, which leads to the path of self-destruction. Oh, not to love is no crime, or so the Jedi believe. It is their code that kills life, their adherence to the will of the Force. The Sith equally become slave because of the last line of their code. The Force shall free me declares that only the Force can free you from chains that prevent you to do anything rather than your own strength and will to power. By having the Force as your only standard by which you may obtain power, the Sith Code proclaims that only by sacrificing your humanity and indulging in your psychotic urges can you obtain freedom, which only further makes you a slave to the Force. At times, I wonder what we would be if the Force was taken from us. If we would truly be Jedi or Sith, or simply human. While questioning Kreia about the origins of the Sith, she gives an overview history of the split between the Jedi and the Sith. The Jedi Civil War is not the first one of its kind. Thousands of years ago, the Jedi had another civil war that split the Order. It was a terrible thing. A faction among the Jedi abandoned the teachings of the Order, following their own path. They waged war on their fellow Jedi, a war that raged across the galaxy. But these fallen Jedi were cast out, defeated, and they retreated to worlds in the Outer Rim. Over time, they took on the mantle of the Lords of the Sith. But in their hearts, they never forgot the Jedi. The hatred for the Jedi Order burns in their veins like fire and echoes in their teachings. Once there were only Jedi, I wonder what evil was in such days. And to think once there were no Jedi at all. Perhaps the Force defies such rigid classification of its followers. In our world, according to Nietzsche, all higher civilization arose from those that imposed their will, desired power, and preyed on the weak. This is what is known as master morality. Then, those who were oppressed by those with power created their own system of morality in opposition to power and saw themselves as superior by not desiring power. This is what is known as slave morality. In dialectic terms, master morality can be considered the original thesis on morality and slave morality was formed as a reaction, forming an antithesis. What is unique to the Star Wars universe is that slave morality was the original thesis with the Jedi, and master morality with the Sith was formed as a reaction, becoming the antithesis. Schiller dialectic can be understood as a thesis, giving rise to reaction, an antithesis that contradicts or negates the thesis until the tension between the two is resolved, creating a synthesis. However, a synthesis is not simply the middle road. It is supposed to overcome the two opposed theses. The problem is that a synthesis has never occurred between the Jedi and the Sith, and is the cause of nearly all the wars in Star Wars. It is simply important to me that the infighting amongst these Jedi religious branches be resolved so the galaxy may be put back together. I do not care which one triumphs. I only want the universe to settle down for a while and catch its breath. All these constant crises are getting somewhat repetitive. This is echoed by Jolie Bindo when he has a talk with Karth. So, Jolie, you decided to leave your little hermitage in the forest and come help us stop the Sith. I guess you realized this was worth coming out of retirement for, huh? Yeah, that's right, Sonny. 
The Sith are the greatest evil to hit the galaxy since, well, the Mandalorians. And they're the worst thing since Exar Kun, blah blah blah, etc, etc, etc. Okay, old man, you lost me there. Are you trying to make a point? Look, everybody always figures the time they live in is the most epic. Most important age to end all ages. But tyrants and heroes rise and fall, and historians sort out the pieces. Malak is a tyrant who should be stopped. If he conquers the galaxy, we're in for a couple of rough centuries. Eventually, it'll come around again. But I'd rather not wait that long. So we do what we have to do, and we try to stop the Sith. But don't start thinking this war, your war, is more important than any other war just because you're in it. That's an interesting theory, but I don't buy it. The Republic stands for something. It stood for something for 15,000 years. And if it falls, everything will change forever. You believe whatever you need to get through this, Sonny. The bottom line is we both want to stop Malik. So let's not get hung up on the details. This discussion references a much larger problem than Jolie even realizes and is at the core of Star Wars and why Kreia hates the Force. At the end of the game, on Malakor 5, you can ask her, why did you do all this? And she gives a very interesting answer. It is said that the Force has a will. It has a destiny for us all. I wield it, but it uses us all, and that is abhorrent to me, because I hate the Force. I hate that it seems to have a will, that it would control us to achieve some measure of balance when countless lives are lost. The important part is the end portion, that the Force creates endless series of balances which results in countless deaths in the galaxy. It is as though everyone is being manipulated under some grand plan in a way that seemed deterministic. Let's take for example the setup of the original Star Wars movie with all the context of the sequels and prequels movies. Leia is given the Death Star plans to R2-D2, a droid that served under her father for decades and is accompanied by C-3PO, a droid that is also built by her father. Both droids end up in the hands of her brother that is living on her father's birth planet. Wow, what are the chances of that happening? Remember we're talking about the Force here. At this point, Malak himself could drop out of the sky and I wouldn't bat an eyelash. Good point. I call it luck. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. But as one trained in the Force, you know that true coincidences are rare. This manipulation to create balances has greater impact to the Star Wars universe than people even realize. With all due respect, Master, is he not the Chosen One? Is he not to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force? So the prophecy says. A prophecy that Miss Reg could have been. You were the Chosen One! It was said that you would destroy the Sith, not join them! Bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness! And how did the Force achieve this balance with Anakin? by having the entire galaxy fight in a war, controlled on both sides by the Sith, have the entire Jedi Order annihilated, then wait 20 years of Sith oppression, and only when the son of the prophesied Chosen One defeats him in a duel, only then, as Anakin sees his own son being tortured, the Sith are destroyed, and balance is achieved. Countless death for balance. That is what Kreia found abhorrent. And unlike what the word balance suggests, this doesn't mean inequality between the light and the dark, like some sort of scale, but simply an eradication of all those that use the dark side of the force, as though all dark side users must be removed, regardless of the cost of life. And this brings up the question of whether or not there is any free will at all in the Star Wars galaxy if everything is balanced out in the end by the force. The Handmaiden and Kreia ponder on this question. The Force can drive others, but there is still choice, is there not? Ah, but at what point does the power the Force exerts submerge any attempt at choice or free will? If there is no choice in the Force, then our teachings and our actions are for nothing, and I refuse to believe that is true. You have taken a complicated question, Servant of Atris, and you have trivialized it with your answer and lack of experience. What is interesting is that despite all the talks of fate and destiny, the Star Wars movies put emphasis on the value of choice as a theme. You're fulfilling your destiny, Anakin. 
It is unavoidable. It is your destiny. You can, you can destroy the Emperor. He has foreseen this. It is your destiny. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. It is the only way. For example, in the original movie, after Han Solo got paid for rescuing the princess, he wanted to leave and not get involved in the war. It's not over yet. It is for me, sister. Look, I ain't in this for your revolution, man. I'm not in it for you, princess. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. You needn't worry about your reward. If money is all that you love, then that's what you'll receive. All license manager station. So, you got your reward and you're just leaving then? That's right, yeah. Got some old debts I gotta pay off with this stuff. Even if I didn't, you don't think I'd be fool enough to stick around here, do you? Come on. Why don't you take a look around? You know what's about to happen, what they're up against. They could use a good pilot like you. You're turning your back on them. What good's a reward if you ain't around to use it? Besides, attacking that battle station ain't my idea of courage. It's more like suicide. All right. Well, take care of yourself, huh? But I guess that's what you're best at, isn't it? What's wrong? Oh, it's Han. I don't know. I really thought he changed his mind. He's got to follow his own path. No one can choose it for him. I have you not. What? Yahoo! You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. The opposite selfish choice can also be seen with Anakin when he has to choose between the Jedi and the Sith. If you wish to become a complete and wise leader, you must embrace a larger view of the Force. Be careful, the Jedi, Anakin. Only through me can you achieve a power greater than any Jedi. Learn to know the dark side of the Force and you will be able to save your wife from certain death. What did you say? Use my knowledge, I beg you. I'm going to turn you over to the Jedi Council. Of course you should. But you're not sure of their intentions, are you? You have great wisdom, Anakin. Know the power of the dark side. Power to save back me. are under arrest, my lord. Anakin, I told you it would come to this. I was right. The Jedi are taking over. The oppression of the Sith will never return. You have lost. He's a traitor! He is the traitor! Ah! I have the power to save the one you love. You oh. must choose. I'm going to end this once and for all. You can't. He must stand trial. He has control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be left alive. I'm too weak. Oh, don't kill me. Please. It's not the Jedi way. He must live. Please don't. I need him. Please don't. No. What have I done? The time has come. Execute Order 66. 
Yes, my lord. The force binds all things. The smallest push, the smallest touch, sends echoes throughout life. These acts of cruelty may have more severe repercussions than you know, or can see. What is even more insane is that it's not simply the wars between the Jedi and the Sith that are being repeated, but similar events themselves keep repeating. And then that with Anakin, you know, kind of duplicating the Luke Skywalker role, but you see the echo of where it all is going to go. And instead of destroying the Death Star, he destroys the ship that controls the robots. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme, mm -hmm. every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Hopefully it'll work. It's like poetry, so they rhyme. 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 Star Wars is possibly the greatest fantasy setting ever made because of this. It ensures that there will always be villains that rise and heroes that will eventually defeat them. It is an eternal recurrence. The same event will keep happening over and over and over and over. From an audience perspective, there's nothing wrong with such a setting, so long as you don't notice many key events being repeated. But, from the perspective of the people living in the Star Wars galaxy itself, this is just madness. That is what Kreia hated about the Force. After leaving the Jedi Order and forming the Sith Triumvirate, Treya had grand plans to save the galaxy from the influence of the Force, but they were never completed. The Academy on Malachor V was left by the old Sith Empire that fed on death that could be harnessed into power. After the activation of the Mass Shadow super weapon during the final moments of the Mandalorian Wars on Malachor V, it could be used as a weapon that builds up echoes that forcefully deafens everyone in the galaxy to the Force or kills them. Now she seeks to create another echo, a wound in the Force, greater than the one before greater than the one you caused. The death of one can send echoes through hundreds, even thousands, across many planets. If not checked, then it spreads until nothing is left. It creates places where the Force is difficult to hear and difficult to find one's way. It will deafen all touched by the Force until no life is left, and with it, the scream will kill all who feel the Force until nothing is left. The number of people that would survive this event would be very low, but the galaxy would be freed from the influence of the Force. However, before this plan could be enacted, Trey was betrayed by Nihilus and Sion that sought power. There are dark places in the galaxy where few tread, ancient centers of learning, of knowledge, but I did not walk alone. To be united by hatred is a fragile alliance at best. But my will was not law. There were disagreements, ambition. From such disagreements, Kreia was born and sought a new purpose. Know that there was once a Darth Treya, and that she cast aside that role, was exiled, and found a new purpose. What do you wish to hear? That I once believed in the Code of the Jedi? That I felt the call of the Sith? That perhaps once I held the galaxy by its throat? 
that for every good work that I did, I brought equal harm upon the galaxy? That perhaps what the greatest of the Sith Lords knew of evil they learned from me? What would it matter now? There is only so much comfort in knowing such things, and it is not who I am now. At last you understand, tiny Jedi. You? Who are you? What are you doing on this sh- Enough. What did you see in the web of worlds that have died? What did you see when you saw it through the Force? I see the death of the galaxy. Of life. At first, I thought it was just conquest. But it's more terrible than that. It's an echo, spreading outwards, killing everything. It's not possible. You are a wasted pawn of the Republic, young one. You could have been so much more, even with your wide-eyed innocence, your naive love for others. Now you understand the magnitude of what is being done. I know you. Not even the markings of the dark side can hide it. Why have you done this? I? Do you think I seek the death of all living things? There is no victory in such things. I do not want to win our war like this, little Jedi. When I win, I wish it to be because I was right, my teachings true. Because she proclaims to no longer follow the Sith. That she is something else, something that seeks balance, through destruction. Stripped of her power and connection to the Force, only one solution remained. To destroy the Jedi and Sith, and to create a synthesis of both ideologies, using the Exile as the basis. I am Kreia, and I am your rescuer, as you are mine. The foundation of Kreia's philosophy can be seen in her name. Names have a great importance in the Star Wars universe. When someone falls to the dark side, they lose their name and become someone new entirely. Henceforth, you shall be known as Darth Vader. Your father was seduced by the dark side of the Force. He ceased to be Anakin Skywalker and became Darth Vader. I've accepted the truth that you were once Anakin Skywalker, my father. That name no longer has any meaning for me. Kreia? Uh, that is not her name. When Kreia was a Jedi Master, she was known as Eren Kai. Then, when she became a Sith Lord, she was known as Darth Treya. The name Kreia is not random. It is a collection of several parts of what she called herself when she was among the Jedi and Sith. Her lightsaber equally reflects this union of opposites. But understanding the creation of a synthesis between the Jedi and the Sith only achieves greater meaning with the addition of the Exile. As a character with its own past history, the Exile is rather important to the Star Wars canon because it is a living embodiment of Kreia's philosophy. After joining the Mandalorian Wars and fighting alongside Revan as a general, the Exile used a super weapon, the Mass Shadow Generator, during the final moments of the war on Malachor V that crippled the Mandalorians. I dreamt of Malachor. I remember the ships, the last stand of the Republic, the tattered remnants of our fleet the largest we could gather. But it was damaged, weakened. The Mandalorians couldn't resist. They tore into us like beasts, shredding our ships to scrap as we fought back. Yet this time, there were no reinforcements for either side. Revan had been delayed out system by Mandalorian scout ships. By the time he arrived, it was too late. And beyond Malachor, there were no more Mandalorians left to die. I remember standing on the bridge with you and watching the destruction of the Republic watching ships full of soldiers and Jedi burn and die. I remember the look you had when you turned to me. It was the longest you'd ever looked at me. You didn't say anything, just a nod. Events moved quickly then, even in my dreams. Flashes, explosions, you falling. I could feel the pain around me. And then the memory, the drifting hulks of the Mandalorian ships, the dead, allies, friends, strangers. And then the echo, lingering, the sound I awakened to in my nightmares. The situation forced your hand. You realized that unless action was taken, the fleet would be destroyed and the Republic would fall. None of us realized the magnitude of what we unleashed. It was nothing more than a slaughter. A slaughter caused by one of my creations. There is a world on the Outer Rim surrounded by mass shadows. 
Past the graveyard of Mandalorian warships, this planet suffers. Crushed in gravity's fist, to walk on its surface is to feel it crushing every cell of your being. It is like being buried alive until it seems you will never breathe again. What manner of creature would have birthed such a thing? Nothing human, to be sure. But unbeknownst to all, this was a plan of conversion orchestrated by Revan to make all those who followed him into war turn to the dark side and swear loyalty to him so that he may attack the Republic years later. Observation. Master, I do not believe that the Mandalorians were the true target at Malachor. I believe that the intention was to destroy the Jedi, break their will, and make them loyal to Revan. I do not know if you examined the records of the deaths on Malachor, but you cannot escape that many of the Jedi and Republic soldiers who died were not Revan's strongest supporters. Observation. I believe that Revan was cleaning house at Malachor V. What ones did not die became Revan's allies against the Republic. Faced with the overwhelming death of allies after the activation of the mass shadow weapon, Everyone was forced to either turn to the dark side or die. There is a place in the galaxy where the dark side of the Force runs strong. It is something of the Sith, but it was fueled by war. It corrupts all that walks on its surface, drowns them in the power of the dark side. It corrupts all life and it feeds on death. Revan knew the power of such places and the power in making them. They can be used to break the will of others, of Jedi, promising them power and turning them to the dark side. Did you never wonder how Revan corrupted so many of the Jedi, so much of the Republic, so quickly? The Mandalorian Wars were a series of massacres that masked another war, a war of conversion, culminating in a final atrocity that no Jedi could walk away from, save one. And that is what I sought to understand. How one could turn away from such power, give up the Force, and still live. But I see what happened now. It is because you had no choice. We did not cut you off from the Force. You were merely deafened to it. Because of that last battle of the Mandalorian Wars. The screams of countless thousands, Jedi and Mandalorians, crushed by the planet's gravity annihilated. Their lives still scream across the surface of that dead planet and within you. To hear the Force over such pain, it is not possible. It was too much for any Jedi to endure, and it is a wonder that you did not die there when thousands perished, all those you had fought with and struggled with. You cut yourself off because you had to if you were to survive. You had hints of it in the war on Doxon. Malachor was simply the final blow. This is what makes the Exile so unique compared to all the Jedi and Sith. Rather than destroy its ego to be in tune with the Force, like all Jedi, or sacrifice its humanity by indulging in psychotic urges for power, like all Sith, the Exile could use the Force as it desired, using the Force as a tool, not as a slave. Because you are a Jedi who turned from the Force and survived and became stronger for it. In you, I see the potential to see the Force die, to turn away from its will, and that is what pleases me. You are beautiful to me, Exile. A dead spot in the Force, an emptiness in which its will might be denied. In times past and in times future, there are Jedi who will stop listening to the Force, those that will try to forget it but maintain unconscious ties, and those, as in the past, just as I, who have had the Force stripped from them. But no Jedi ever made the choice you did, to sever ties so completely, so utterly, that it leaves a wound in the Force. And that is why I chose you. You are not a Jedi. You are not Sith. Not truly. And it is for that that I love you. I would have killed the galaxy to preserve you. I would have let the galaxy die. You are more rare than you know. And what you have taught yourself must not be allowed to die. At the end of the game, there is a path that Kreia desired the Exile to choose that would have changed the face of the galaxy. Rather than destroying Malachor, 
you can remain there and become a teacher, attracting the next generation of force sensitive that feel the echo and teach them how to use the force. You may take one of the ships that orbit Malachor and depart this place, or you may remain here on Malachor and wait for the others, those touched by the force, who will come in time. Then you shall become a teacher, as I once was. I am proud. It is difficult to turn away from battle and adventure, and to instead guide others along their path. By becoming a beacon to all four sensitive that feel the echo, and for them to remain on Malachor V, Kreia's teaching would persist beyond her death and save the galaxy. You must understand that the General would not wish the relics or the Sith strength here on Malachor to be compromised. Their presence is needed to stabilize the galaxy. However, despite what Kreia desired, canonly, the Exile never made this choice and destroyed Malachor V. The Jedi Council was rebuilt and nothing was learned. A true synthesis was never created, and the wars between the Jedi and the Sith continued endlessly. The original Star Wars movies were meant to be the ending saga of the wars between the Jedi and the Sith, as Anakin was prophesied to finally bring balance to the Force and destroy the Sith. This is why there weren't supposed to be any movies made after Return of the Jedi. Luke refused to forsake his friends by blindly following the teachings of Yoda and the Jedi Code, yet also refused to fall to the dark side like his father before him. Luke was destined to reform the Jedi into something familiar but also new. In the expanded universe, this is exactly what Luke did with the new Jedi Order. However, now that Disney has complete ownership of the Star Wars franchise, this war will truly never end. It's time for the Jedi to end. Star Wars may be a fantasy in space, with many silly moments and wacky adventures, but it cannot be denied that it is a cultural touchstone, representing the universal zeitgeist of humanity in popular culture. Paying tribute to past old myths and fables and movies in fresh new ways, using the hero's journey along with many cultural archetypes, folklore, mythology, samurai movies, western cowboy stories, merging it all to create a true monomyth that endlessly repeats for all time. And while Kreia's philosophy can be understood as an examination of everything regarding the Star Wars universe, it also serves as a criticism of her own dialectic system of morality. Kreia is not simply an amazingly well-written female character, but a person that stood alone among the dualistic morality that represents all of human culture and sought the truth to save everyone. Take what strength you may steal from me, that is all I need be to you.